helpful if the speakers, oh, sorry, are we streaming to the world now? Have it? Yeah. Have it? Are we going live? Yes, we are live, sir. Can, can we but leave that? Still, just, but uh, just, we have seven minutes to start the program. Oh, sorry, yeah, can, can we just stay on the Zoom and not the not the YouTube just now? Hi, Raghu. Hi, everybody. Hello. Can we get back to Zoom, Avinit? Yes, yes, we are on Zoom, sir. And can you can you confirm we're not streaming just now? It says we're streaming just now, but we're still having our pre no, pre webinar this, discussion. This is now live on YouTube. Yes, but we don't want to be live until three thirty. Yes. Or eight o'clock your time. So not live just now. Because we're still discussing how we will run the webinar. I'll I'll take my discussion onto WhatsApp. <laughs> no, no, that's, 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 Hi, Fiona. Hi, everyone. Hi, John. I think we're, we're streaming Hi, live at the moment, John, so you might want to just mute just now. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, I, I will. I will. And um, I think there'll be some, some WhatsApp chat. Thanks. We are about to start in five minutes. I hope audio and everything is clear on YouTube as well. Okay, uh, can I uh, have a net? Yes. Can we just be on Zoom just now, separate from the YouTube or not? Yeah, it is on YouTube as well, sir. It's on this. No, no. Can we just be Zoom and not YouTube on this conversation? No, we can't stop it in the middle. Okay. Are you there, Rigu? Yes, very much. Yeah. And so uh, we'll probably just uh, keep quiet for a few moments uh, before the... Uh, we start and I'll let you start and then I'll come in and uh, introduce as well and then let you do your introduction then we'll start with the talks and um, we'll probably maybe easier to save some of the questions um, that come up on on the chat and we can do those at the at the close of play uh, that might be the easiest way of doing it uh, would that be okay yes thank you yeah lovely okay
Namaskaram. On behalf of the Association of Surgeons of India, a very warm welcome to all the participants from not only Bharat, from, but from all across the world. I have great pleasure inviting Mr. John Scott, one of the vice presidents of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, a world-renowned plastic surgeon from Glasgow, to give his introductory remarks. Over to you, John. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to join uh, the Association of Surgeons of India and this joint venture with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow. The previous uh, seminars have been a wonderful success, and I'm sure this evening's will be a success also. I'd like to hand back uh, to Raghu and to introduce the first session. Thank you. Thank you, John. So I'm sharing my screen. It gives me great pleasure and a great, it's a indeed well and truly an honor to be one of the moderators alongside Mr. John Scott in this two part webinar, which is being hosted by the Association of Surgeons of India and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow. The first part is being held today and the second part will be in July. The aims of breast assessment is to obtain a definitive diagnosis in a timely way. There should be only three routine assessment outcomes. No problem, diagnosis of benign lesion or a diagnosis of cancer and assessment should end at diagnosis and not before. Eight out of 10 breast lumps we know are benign and indeed, most benign breast health issues require only conservative management. The principal goals being reassuring the worried well. Worried because women who present with any breast health issue, many of them think they have cancer, but the majority don't. And to introduce the talks for this evening are the first is the most important and fundamental aspect of triple assessment that would be highlighted by Dr. Som Shekhar, a world-renowned surgical oncologist, global director for Aster Healthcare based out of Bangalore and the past president of the Association of Breast Surgeons of India. I request him to deliver the first presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aunit. Warm welcome to this third joint webinar on Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow and Association of Surgeons of India. I bring warm regards both from ASI and also Association of Press Surgeons of India. Today, my presentation is on approach to a lump in the breast, how triple assessment helps as a part of ABC new breast health. I bring warm regard from my institution too. In India, the breast cancer is unique. It happens one decade early. Young woman tends breast, very difficult to evaluate the lump benign or malignant, and they're hurt to new positive and very difficult to image. That is one of the reasons very important to assess their benign or malignant. Why we should know about this? One of the reasons is, if we can distinguish a lump into benign, we don't have to do unwanted procedure, put unwanted cuts on the breast, do a biopsy, excision biopsy, just to know they're benign. On the contrary, we can pick up the breast cancer easier, simple way, without false negative, false positive, without putting multiple scars or incision, and losing an opportunity to do a good breast conservation and the right incision at the first time with oncoplasty. If we can identify a lump into a breast cancer in early stage 1, QRs are very high to 95 to 90, 
6% per year. And as we come down to stage 2, stage 3, the survival drops down to 50%. So very important to identify when a lady comes with a lump like this, whether it is benign or malignant. So we clearly know what is benign, we can leave it, not to unwanted surgery. What is malignant? Do a one sitting surgery, right incision, right autoplasty, give a best chance of breast preservation for her rather than multiple surgery, biopsy, more cost and delay in the treatment initiation and loss of overall survival. So it is important for us to know how to proceed. So it is it is very important. Only 10% of the lumps are cancer. 90% if you do a triple assessment may turn out benign labiates. Maybe a fibrodinoma, benign breast disease, or it may be a granulomatous mastitis. And blood discharge is only 0.5% chance of malignancy. We know unilateral postmenopausal serous watery discharge can have cancer, or the other discharge chance is very less. And almost mastalgia chance of cancer is very, very close, less than 1%, close to 0%. Most of the time, a lump could be benign, at least fibrodinoma or inflammatory pathology, granulomatous mastitis, or a ductal cell uh, CA, which could be a precancerous. So, what is a component of triple assessment? Good clinical examination, imaging, memo, and ultrasound, where it is required to couple that, and then a pathological evaluation by a core biopsy. So, clinical, imaging, ultrasound, memo, core biopsy is a part. Every surgeon should learn how to do image-guided core biopsies, whatever type of core needle you use, and not rely on FNAC, which is false positive, false negative, low specificity, delays the treatment, unwanted surgery may be done, and it may turn out something else. And we must learn how to do a good core biopsy. So, clinical examination, good history, thorough examination with the patient being comfort, examine both breast, axilla, supraclavicular area, and thorough history. The reason is, you know, it could be a thick mass, indentation, skin erosion, red or hot, fluid could be there, dimpling may be there, there may be a bump, there may be an invisible lump, but the architectural change, retraction, intraparenchymal fixity, or there may be a sunken nipple, change in the shape of the breast, or there may be engorge veins coming, or there may be orange peel, but orange. So, there are various clinical examination. So, clinical examination should be done by a clinician. Understand the right position, know the boundaries of the breast, proper pattern, finger position, movement, pressure, duration is very important. And remember, both supine, sitting, hands above and beside, and cover all the area of the breast from clavicle to six costal costal junction to the axillary fold to the midline, axilla, supraclavicular, inframemory fold, and then also axillary tail. All has to be analyzed properly. Thoroughly do a finger examination in multiple places with a pad of finger, with three middle finger, with light, medium and deep. Spend considerable time, at least three minutes per breast to understand the complexity. Don't be in a rush to be. And the gold standard, why is it triple assessment? Because more than 95% of patients, you can get a diagnosis right away in one if you do a triple assessment as much as close to 99%. If you don't do a proper triple assessment, if you miss it, a woman would come with a higher lesion and if you can do a breast imaging, mammogram, ultrasound and then couple up with guided, image guided core, you can pick up very small early T1 lesions. Memo. You must know there may be three view, but two view is compulsory. Craniocaudal, mediolateral, oblique and you must understand in this era of TOMO and also, you know, uh, digital imaging, the compression required. What is an ideal mammogram? How you should do that? What is mediolateral view? How the junction between the breast and the pectoral fascia, pectoral muscle should be seen? Inflammatory fold should be included. Tail of axilla should be included. And full breast tissue should be there so we don't miss any lesion calcification. Nipple abnormalities, medial fold, pectoral, all should be seen. And you must identify and read the memo thoroughly yourself, then with your breast imaging specialist. And you must know what is a right way to do an ideal mammogram so you don't miss any lesions in any part of the breast, including a lesion or a microcarp. So, quadrant-wise, you must know how to identify before even you can, you know, examine a patient. And there are multiple types, the dense breast, less dense, fatty breast based on patient's age. You can have a type 1 pattern where it is a dense lesion. It may be a type 2 pattern, fatty breast, easy to identify like a glass, or you may have a pattern by a dense breast where, you know, memo is very difficult and ultrasound examination may be very, very important. So, these are part of 
is in an young woman always add an ultrasound and rarely an MRI. The only selected indication of MRI, don't be choose it. Sensitivity of a mammogram if done properly is very high and in deaths it is only 65%. That is why you may miss a mass or a calcification, you need to add more imaging modality. Try to identify the secondary signs of the cancer, nipple inversion, I, I know architecture change, thickening, acryl lymph node, retraction, developing new density. People should not be worried about the density. Women are afraid, oh, I'll get a more uh, a radiation, I may develop malignancy. No. FDA dose limit is 1 to 2 C words. You know, such a high rate. So, a woman, every year mammogram up to her full life will not be a carcinogenic and we can give confidence to her. Uh, your team should know how to do a Birard scoring. So, you know what is the Birard scoring and which is for follow-up, which is benign, which needs an immediate attention and a biopsy to rule out scoring from 0 to 6. 0 needs either an ultrasound, sometime indeterminate lesion, maybe an MRI in selected place. Ultrasound extremely important because it identifies cyst or uh, you know, tumor and it shows the architecture useful in young woman, pregnancy, and then when, when you can't compress the breast, when it is an LABC or if the patient is lactating or if the patient, uh, you know, is having an inflammatory, it is very important. All ultrasound breast is not same as sonomammogram. It's a high frequency, 5 to 12 megahertz, and the patient is supine, arms raised. Quadrant-wise, you must do a scan, identify the type of the lesion, whether longitudinal or if it is transverse, vertical diameter. We are looking at a cyst or a benign lesion or a fibroadenoma or is it a complicated cyst where a solid part needs a core biopsy? Is it an abscess or a galactosis? And what is the shape? Is there a calcification or not? And is there a malignant characteristic like speculation, non-parallel orientation, microlocalization, microcluster calcification and then many other factors you can actually know. So in workup in young woman ultrasound, 20 to 30 ultrasound first only if there is a pathology, don't unnecessarily subject to memo. If there is an elderly lady, memo and ultrasound. If pregnancy and lactation, only ultrasound. So as per the American College of the Guideline, MRI is not to be performed in all misused, BRCA carriers, family history of multiple cancer and they carry hereditary familial cancer. They have a breast augmentation done, silicon processes is there or they are leprominy and high risk. Or post-radiation, you are not able to identify the scar indeterminate. Or in MEO axilla, with ultrasound and breast and memo is normal. Only then in MRI, otherwise don't misuse it, even though it is useful in a young cells patient. So non-screening indications are only these, don't misuse it. Why triple assessment? A good triple assessment, avoid unwanted open scars, open biopsy, big scar, multiple procedure. You can plan breast conservation better with one time. Two procedure is avoided to cause pain, agony, delay in treatment. Cost is lowest by doing triple assessment. So everybody must learn how to do a core needle biopsy. Ever since in 1982, Prilligren in Sweden showed this. You can do it. Usually we use a 14 or 16 gauge. Or you can go even into 20 gauge. Image guided is better. Multiple core biopsy needle are there. Make sure you are comfortable. Please you take it. Make sure that... The patient is clean, clear, local anesthesia is given. You explain the patient what to do. Take at least four to five good course. So you can do immunohistochemistry, chemistry, ER, PR, how to do KI-67. You can decide whether the patient is a candidate for upfront surgery or new adjuvant treatment. There is no false positive, false negative. DCAS invasive are not missed. Benign versus malignant is not missed. And you understand, put a compression and make sure these patients are not an anticoagulant. Please avoid FNACs, insufficient material, Good cytopathology is required, can't distinguish invasive from DCIS, receptor study cannot be done, and in your adjuvant setting, you may be wrong and give a treatment, then it could be just a non-malignant pathology, so do that. Advantages of triple assessment, good tissue with core, receptor study possible, one sitting, and good conservation can be done. So take all these precautions. So in conclusion, triple assessment, clinical evaluation, mammogram, core biopsy, extremely important. And this is the flow chart because of the water of time I'll not do. You can take a screenshot of this. This is prepared from ABSI modules. And I thank them for this, how you can go it. And these modules are available on ABSI. You can write to us where standardization of breast care in India, ABC, every breast surgeon, what they have to know. Representing general surgeon, surgical oncoplastic surgeon, breast surgeons is available in this module. And they're also published across the various journals. So thank you very much on behalf of ASI.
Royal College of Surgeons and Physicians, Glasgow, and APSI, we convey a warm regard. Thank you for your patient listening. And the message is triple assessment and core biopsy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Somshekar. That was very insightful. I request, Doctor, I before I request the next speaker, I request all of you watching this program to send in your questions if you have any and post it in the chat box and the speakers will try to answer this and also we will address this at the end of the program. So I now request another renowned surgeon from India who is uh, from the world-renowned JIPMER in Pondicherry and is a member of the National Executive Committee of the Association of Breast Surgeons of India, Dr. Kadambari, to speak about fibroadenoma and breast cysts. Dr. Kadambari, please unmute Hello, I am Kadambri from Chitma Pondicherry, India, and I'm happy to be involved in this joint webinar series being conducted by the ASI with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow. I thank Dr. Prabal and Dr. Dakudam for involving me in this exercise. Uh, I'm going to be talking about two very common benign breast conditions that we see in our daily practice, the fibrogenoma and the breast cysts. I will deal with this topic under these four headings. I will look at the pathogenesis from the perspective of the ANDI model. I will also talk about the common clinical presentations of both these conditions and how we diagnose them using imaging and pathology and a word about their management. The ANDI, or the Appellation of Normal Development and Involution, is a concept which was described uh, in the late 70s and has gone a long way in clearing some, some of the confusion that arose around the various terminologies that were being used to describe the different benign breast uh, disorders. So the ANDI uh, basically uh, is structured as a bidirectional matrix. And as you can see in this slide, the horizontal arm of the matrix describes three processes, beginning with normal physiology, uh, which may undergo an aberrated change. And uh, uh, the third component of this being a disease presentation. And the vertical arm describes the three stages of progression of development, cyclical activity and involution. The development which occurs in early reproductive years, cyclical activity during the mature reproductive years, and the involution phase, which begins in the later part of the reproductive phase and goes on until menopause. So, as for the ANDI concept, if you look at a normal development process like lobular development, which occurs in the earlier phases, and the normal involution process occurring in the lobules during the later part of the woman's life, these can occur, these can undergo aberrations. And these result in fibrogenoma and macrocyst respectively. And as per this concept, these are aberrations and not to be considered as disease processes. And the hypothesis is that they occur because of variations in response to hormones uh, during these phases of development. So a fibroadenoma occurs as per this concept because of unusual responsiveness of the lobule to estrogen, leading to proliferation. However, because this proliferation is polyclonal, is limited, does not grow uh, without any restriction, and importantly, it constitutes a, a, a normal relationship between the epithelium and the myothelium, and further, it involutes. 
uh, towards menopause. So all these are pointers to say that it is not a disease and not a neoplasm. Clinically, a fibroadenoma is pretty easy to diagnose. It's a firm, non-tender mass, which is characterized by extreme mobility. And uh, giving it the name, the breast mouse, all of you must have heard of that term. Usually, it doesn't cross three centimeters itself. In most uh, women, in, uh, it remains less than three centimeters. But rarely, it grows larger. If it grows to beyond five centimeters, it is termed a giant fibroma. As you can see in this picture, a young woman uh, with a large tumor, and this almost mimics a soft tissue malignancy of the breast. On ultrasound imaging, it's characteristically hypoechoic, has an oval shape with sharp circumscribed margins. Occasionally, you might be able to pick up a blood flow, and there may be a uh, visible posterior enhancement. In an older woman, it may be picked up on an incidental mammogram. Incidentally, on a mammogram, there may be multiple foci of coarse calcification, which has been termed the popcorn calcification. Pathologically, grossly, uh, it is characterized by a populated surface. It has a very well defined uh, demarcation from the surrounding breast tissue, except in older women, as in the second picture where you can see that there is a surrounding fibrinosis and the demarcation is less spread out. Uh, cytology uh, shows these uh, sheets of uh, monotonous epithelial cells with a background of bare nuclei. Histology, there are two very commonly known variants, the pericanalicular type where the epithelial elements are prominent and the intracanalicular type where the stroma is proliferated uh, and pushes the SNI into cleft-like spaces. Coming to the breast cysts, there are many types of breasts, but I'm going to be talking about the cysts which are described by the ANDI model. So according to this concept, uh, during the normal epithelial and involution of the lobule, which occurs, uh, if the stroma disappears too early, the epithelial SNI remain. And these can go on to form microsis, which could cause obstruction of the efferent duct ductule and result in the formation of a macrosis. So these are seen in older women, pretty common, and they're usually incidentally picked up on routine uh, clinical examination. Sometimes they can be painful when they become tense in the perimenstrual period. It's a usually a smooth surface and swelling has prediction for the upper outer quadrant. Imaging, the most common form is the cysts, which is a well-defined defined and equoid lesion uh, categorized as pirate. And as you can see here, you, you might have a single palpable cyst, but on imaging, you may see multiple cysts, which are not clinically picked up. A more complicated form is when you have internal debris or a fluid level, and this would be categorized as a complicated cyst and bilateral. And a more complex picture, which is uh, labeled as bilateral 4, is when you have internal septation or a solid element with internal vascularization or a predominantly solid lesion with some cystic support. And these uh, complexes would necessarily have to be uh, sampled by a biopsy. So a typical breast cyst appears uh, bluish in color, and that's given it the name blue dome cyst. And the contents of the cyst, when you aspirate them, can vary. They're usually colored. They are the contents are not usually clear. They are colored, and if they are blood stained, obviously that would be a more ominous feature, and could suggest an intracystic bacterial malignancy. The lining could be uh, an apocrine columnar epithelium, or it could be flattened out, as you can see in this macrocyst. With respect to treatment, they, both fibroadenoma and breast cysts, are treated non surgically. And surgery, when it's required, is only done for larger cysts, uh, sorry, larger fibroadenomas, 
and the nucleation with the incision placed directly over the swelling is recommended procedure. Cysts are rarely aspirated, uh, only when they are painful or very large. Uh, we usually do not aspirate them because of the, the risk of infection, which is pretty common in our patients. And usually they don't recur when aspirated. So to summarize a fibrotinoma and resolute uh, arise from resolute, uh, either at the development stage or at the intubation stage. Fibrotinomas are characterized by a static phase of growth uh, after an initial growth phase. And surgery is no longer recommended as a routine treatment. Cysts, again, are treated non-operatively and unless they contain bloodstain fluid, in which case we need to biopsy them to rule out blood. Thank you very much, and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Kadambri. I now have great pleasure in introducing Ms. Julie Doughty, another renowned surgeon from Glasgow, a passionate teacher who has been very actively involved in running the Breast Trainees Forum in Glasgow for a number of years. Um, and she has been the past president of the Association of Breast Surgery in the UK, who will be addressing about breast pain. Thank you, Julie. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be joining you all from sunny Northumberland, which is the northernmost county of the United Kingdom. It's actually beautiful and sunny here. Um, so I'm going to talk about breast pain. I'm just about to share my screen with you. Um, yeah, I think here we go. Hello, I'm Julie Doughty. I'm one of the breast surgeons. I work in Glasgow um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about assessment and management of um, breast pain. So breast pain is very, very common. Um, most breast pain is hormonal and I suppose you can compare it a little bit to period pain. Um, Ada surveyed 1,100 patients who were coming to clinics for other reasons to ask about breast pain. And what he found was that during the lifetime, about 70% of women had breast pain. So similar to how many women have period pain over the lifetime. 11% of those women. So in the UK, we see 700,000 new patient referrals a year of patients referred to the breast clinic. And over the last 10 years, the referral of women with breast symptoms has gone up by 100%. And what this has meant is it's put a huge strain on our two-week wait pathway for urgent referrals for suspicion of breast cancer. And despite this huge increase in referrals, the amount of breast cancer diagnosed has increased only by 14%. And that's because the majority of this increase in referrals is in women who are under the age of 40 years old. That's now, why could this be? Well, we know that in the media, um, anyone who is famous or a celebrity who has breast cancer, that is widely advertised. Recently, there's been a presenter in the UK who's had breast cancer who said she presented with breast pain. And obviously, this type of coverage causes increased anxiety in women. Here, I've shown the two um, information leaflets from the two main breast cancer charities in the UK, Breast Cancer Now uh, and Copper Feel, which is the charity that looks at younger women. And although it says that breast pain itself is not usually a sign of breast cancer, it does still say that pain in your breast or under your arm um, is a symptom that you should be referred with. So again, these kind of campaigns, I think, can often lead to anxiety in women and, and may be contributing to the increased number of referrals we see. So this is a study which was done from the Manchester group led by Ashu Gandhi and Rajiv Dave, looking at does breast pain 
is it a symptom of breast cancer? So this was a prospective study, I think one of the largest studies of its type, looking at 10,830 new patient referrals over a, over a period of a year in the Manchester Breast Unit. Now, of these almost 11,000 women, nearly 4,000 pain was one of the symptoms these women presented with. But in just under 2,000 patients, the patients presented with pain alone. Now, in these almost 2,000 patients with pain, only less than 1% had a clinical P3 to P5 on examination, which would negate further investigation. And when they looked at this big prospective cohort, they found that breast cancer was identified in only 0.4% of patients and this is less than the amount of cancers that are detected through breast screening. So the conclusion from this large perspective study was that women who have breast cancer, who have breast pain, rarely have breast cancer. So the conclusion is from this study that pain is rarely a symptom of breast cancer. However, both patients and primary care physicians frequently think it is, and I think this leads to heightened patient anxiety. So the Association of Breast Surgery has published a statement on breast pain, uh, and this is on the Association of Breast Surgeon Surgery website, and it's really been instigated because the amount of increased referrals, um, the majority of which are in younger women, and a huge number of these have breast pain, we feel are not best served in the um, one-stop pathway that we have at the minute. And ABS are working on new pathways, new ways of seeing these patients, which are being evaluated. So all centres throughout the UK have different ways of seeing women with breast pain. In Glasgow, we tend to see them in what we call low-risk clinics, where we don't have mammography. But there's many other types of clinics throughout the UK which are currently being evaluated. But this is really to try and address the huge increased number of referrals that we've had. So if we think of breast pain, I think there's we can classify it into three types, cyclical, non-cyclical and chest wall pain. So cyclical breast pain is the most frequent type of breast pain we see. And 70% of patients with breast pain will have this type of pain. It's usually worse two weeks before a period and the pain decreases with the onset of the period. The pain is usually bilateral, but it can be unilateral. It's in the upper outer quadrant of the breast usually. And this is the type of pain that can be associated with breast swelling, heaviness and the breast being tender to touch. This pain occurs due to normal hormone variations of the menstrual cycle. And it's important, I think, to let the patient know that it's not due to a hormone imbalance. And when patients come in the 20s and 30s asking for hormone profiles to be done, this is really not necessary. This is just normal hormonal variation. And it occurs because the progesterone levels tend to increase to promote ovulation. This stimulates the proliferation of glandular tissue and you get edema of the breast stroma and this may result in fullness, swelling and breast pain. The oral contraceptive pill can also cause cyclical breast pain and in postmenopausal women on HRT, they can also experience this type of pain. The second type of breast pain is what we call non-cyclical. Now, this doesn't usually follow the menstrual cycle, so it's not worse just two weeks before a period. Again, this pain can be unilateral, um, it can be focal, and it may be constant or intermittent. There's different causes of non-cyclical pain, so this can also be due to hormonal variation, similarly to cyclical nostalgia. It can be due to large breasts stretching the ligaments of Astley Cooper, it can be due to cysts, infection, Mondo's disease can all cause non-cyclical breast pain. 
Now, finally, you can have extra mammary pain, which is usually what we would call chest wall pain. And this is the type of pain which is most common in postmenopausal women who are not on HRT. This pain is not arising from the breast itself. It's usually unilateral, but it can be bilateral. The pain is more frequent in older women and they describe it as a sharp burning pain. Now, the main cause of this pain is musculoskeletal pain, either coming from the costochondral junction, costochondritis or Tietze syndrome, or it can come from the muscle underlying the breast, either the pectoral muscle or the serratus anterior muscle. We mustn't forget that breast pain can also be referred pain, it can be referred from the heart, the chest, the gallbladder and or esophagus. And in older women, I think this is when it's really important to take a full history um, to see if there's any associated symptoms, to decide whether this is actually chest wall pain or it may be coming from elsewhere. So how do we evaluate patients with breast pain? So I think for me, the most important thing is to reassure these patients, to let them know that in most patients, breast pain is, is normal and most people will have it at some part of their life. And it's to try and prevent them coming back for numerous clinic appointments. So I think the first thing is you need to get a good description of the pain. Is it related to the cycle? When does it come on? Is it worse after exercise? Does anything make the pain better or worse? I think another really important thing is when you're evaluating patients with breast pain is you need to look at risk factors and in particular family history. So most women will overestimate their lifetime risk of breast cancer. And I'm sure we've all had numerous patients who come to the clinic and are worried and say they're at increased risk because their great aunt had breast cancer or their grandmother had breast cancer. And when you take a history, you'll find that their mum is okay. They have numerous both maternal and paternal aunts. So that gran or great aunt confers no increased risk of breast cancer to that patient. And I think the patient needs, it's really important that we tell the patient that and their risk of breast cancer and their family history is thoroughly explained to them. So when, after we've taken that history, we need to do a clinical examination. Now we need to do a full examination, both breasts and axillae. Now, if on that examination, you identify a, a sign like a lump, discharge, tethering, then that patient has to be investigated appropriately for that symptom as we would any patient attending the one-stop clinic. So if you find a lump, that patient needs triple assessment. I think you then need to decide, is the breast pain arising from the breast or is it arising from the chest wall? And for me, the best way to do that is to lie the patient on the side and palpate the chest wall gently to see if you can elicit, elicit the pain that the patient is experiencing. Now, I have to say, if you don't do it gently, anyone who you examine the chest wall and you examine it firmly will experience chest wall tenderness. Because as we know, the, the bone has a rich nerve supply. And if you feel firmly, that patient will experience chest wall pain. So you need to ensure that you examine the chest wall gently. Now, I think this is probably the most controversial area in that what imaging do we offer patients with breast pain? So this is the UK guidance from 2019, the Royal College of Radiology guidance, imaging for breast pain. So at the start, the first thing they say is that breast pain alone is not an indication for imaging. However, if you look at the last point on the slide, it says that women aged 40 or over with breast pain or tenderness alone 
may be offered a mammogram for screening. So as you know, in the UK, we start breast screening in, at the age of 50. So anyone 40 or over, this is using their attendance at the breast clinic as an opportunity to do an, an opportunistic screen. And my experience is that if you offer these women mammography, 999 out of 1,000 will say, yes, they want a mammogram. So I suppose in practice, in the UK, the vast majority of women over 40 with breast pain will receive a mammogram. If patient has focal tenderness, then if they're over 40, mammography and ultrasound, and if they are under 40 and they have focal tenderness, so that is tenderness in one particular point, not tenderness over a quadrant of a breast, then ultrasound uh, can be carried out. Again, as I've said on clinical examination, if there are focal signs, then they should be imaged as per guidance for a breast lump or nipple discharge. That's how that patient needs to be investigated. So that is the UK guidance. What about elsewhere? So in the American College of Radiology, they have divided breast pain up into three categories. So the first one, women with cyclical insignificant pain, which they describe as being non-focal in more than one quadrant, diffuse or, cycle, or cyclical at any age with no suspicious clinical findings, they would advocate no imaging. So I think that is similar to the UK guidance, but they don't have the caveat that if the patient wants mammography um, for opportunistic screening, then they can be offered that, probably because in America, women undergo more mammographic screening more frequently and at a younger age than they do in the UK. Women who have significant breast pain, so focal, non-cyclical, less than 30, then imaging would be ultrasound scan of the breast. And I think we would agree that if someone has focal tenderness in one particular area, ultrasound would be appropriate. The thing, the area, however, that differs significantly to the UK and I think the rest of Europe is that women with, again, significant, so they describe that as focal and non-cyclical, aged between 30 and 39, they would perform mammography, toma synthesis and ultrasound scan. So we would definitely not do that. We would not carry out mammography in women under the age of 40 unless they had a suspicious clinical sign so in this group of patients, we would recommend ultrasound only. So what about treatment? So again, and I can't, I can't stress this enough, we need to reassure the patient that clinical examination is normal, that we have not identified any abnormality, and to stress that breast pain is not an indicator of breast cancer. We also need to clearly clarify their breast cancer risk, um, especially with regard to family history, as, as I've stated, many patients will hugely overestimate their risk of breast cancer based on distant relatives having breast cancer. So there are simple supportive measures that we can recommend. Now, for all of these, there's not great evidence, there's no randomised trials, but none of these things are going to do any harm. And in many patients, they will work. So the patient should be measured for a well-fitting bra. You need to discuss, do they use a wired bra? Quite often, patients with chest wall pain would be because the wire is sticking into the rib at that particular point. And changing from an underwire to a front-fastening sports bra often gives good relief. Eliminating caffeine will often help breast pain, a diet low in saturated fat, trying vitamin E and vitamin B6. So all of those things may help, although they're not evidence-based. A lot of patients with breast pain do have severe anxiety. 
and measures to address anxiety, not pharmacological, uh, not pharmacological, but other methods like breathing exercises, um, talking therapy, that can often help. And finally, something that does work very well is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory gel, especially um, in patients who you think have chest wall pain. Evening primrose oil, again, or starflower oil does work in certain patient groups, although the meta-analysis did show no benefit. If you are going to use this, then you need to tell the patient that the active ingredient is gamma linoleic acid and the amount that is in each tablet will vary. For the evening primrose oil or starflower oil itself, the need to take high dose, about two to 3,000 milligrams a day, and the need to take two to 300 milligrams of GLA per day. The need to take it for at least three months before it works, and you can't take this if you're trying to conceive or you are epileptic. Finally, if we look at more pharmacological um, approaches, so bromocryptine, I think, should not be used. The side effects outweigh the benefits and it is not approved. Danazole is approved in the US by the FDA. The amount you need to take is 100 to 400 milligrams a day, but it has pretty unpleasant side effects. So weight gain, menorrhagia, deepening of voice, acne, muscle cramps, and male pattern baldness. And often when you discuss these side effects with patients, they really don't want to take it. Tamoxifen does work well for breast pain, but you have to tell the patients it's not licensed in this situation. There's numerous studies which show it does reduce breast pain, and I would always start with the low dose of 10 milligrams a day. Again, you need to discuss the side effects with the patient before you start it, and you also need to tell them that it's not licensed for breast pain. So in conclusion, we see lots of patients with breast pain, and it's important to remember that pain is rarely a symptom of breast cancer. Despite this, both patients and primary care physicians frequently think it is, and this leads to high anxiety in this patient population. We certainly need better education to try and inform patients that breast pain is not a worrying symptom. We need better pathways to assess patients with breast pain. And when we see patients in the clinic, we need to reassure them. We need to give them advice. We need to tell them their personal breast cancer risk and we need to discharge them from the clinic. We don't need to see patients back repeatedly with breast pain because this will just heighten their anxiety that we think there is something seriously wrong. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ms. Doughty. So there have been some questions and I shall just... Um... Uh, start off with Dr. Somshaker. What is the role of FNAC as a part of triple assessment? Because much as the Association of Breast Surgeons of India has been actively, uh, you know, and proactively speaking about the role of core needle biopsy, uh, there are a number of patients who are referred, and I see them second and third opinion on a daily basis, even from major centers with just an FNA. What is your view about this? Uh, I, I fully agree with you, uh, Raghu. Uh, you know, uh, the biggest problem in evaluation of breast lump is an FNAC. People think that FNAC is going to give an answer, but in fact, that itself adds to a lot of problem. Number one, it has got very low specificity. It has got very high false negative rate. You don't get a tissue to do immunohistochemistry because in breast cancer, if you indeed have a breast cancer, luminal A and B are the only one who undergo surgery directly. And if you have a lesion, which is more than three centimeter, triple negative heart to new, you lose an opportunity to do new adjuvant treatment. FNSE cannot distinguish in situ versus invasive. It is highly user dependent. You know, people think that FNSE is very easy, cheap, easily performed, but remember, it may look easy for you to do, but you need the most advanced 
excellent cytopathologist, which is very, very difficult. Unlike a core biopsy, most of the pathologists can standardize it. Also, you do an FNA because of more false negative, low specificity. You keep getting inconclusive report. You keep repeating multiple FNACs when itself will delay the diagnosis, delay the institution of treatment, compromise the overall survival. It leads to multiple procedure. Then there will be one clinician who would get restless, patient would restless. They hop from hospital to hospital. Then they will do an incision biopsy. It's crime to know and do an incision biopsy to know what is today in breast. And that itself is jeopardize a good single sitting, single incision, right cosmetic incision and oncoplasty and may end up losing a breast. Not to forget medical legal issues. It's crime to do an organ ablation or a axillary treatment on an FNAC where you're wrong. And there are n number of judgment both in India across the world you cannot do. So in short, don't think FNAC is cheap and easy. That will be the most expensive because of all the factors I told. Better to do a good core biopsy, wait for two to three days, have a definitive diagnosis, have a good decision making, have a good informed consent and discussion with patient, institute a right treatment. Thanks very much, uh, Som. That's been crystal clear. Two questions uh, to start off uh, for Dr. Kadambri. The size of the fibroadenoma with regards to excision and management of multiple fibroadenomas, is there any role for surgery? Uh, regarding the size, uh, generally it is the larger fibroadenomas which are removed, uh, mostly because of cosmetic reasons. Uh, the In an older woman who presents with a fibroadenoma, the size criterion may be uh, reduced to maybe even less than three centimeters because uh, sometimes we need to be absolutely sure that uh, we are not missing uh, a malignancy. And as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, fibroadenomas in older women are not characteristically mobile. And there may be some clinical suspicion uh, because of a surrounding fibroadenosis, and that could restrict its mobility. So in order to do that, we would have to do a careful core needle biopsy and maybe end up with an excision. Uh, regarding multiple fibroadenomas, that is a very, very common scenario. And we, in fact, pick up these uh, fibroadenomas when we do an imaging uh, for some other indication. And if they are small, impalpable, obviously we will not be advising any treatment. Uh, the problem arises when we do occasionally see uh, young uh, girls or young uh, women with multiple fibroadenomas which keep growing in size and uh, they keep coming back with a new lesion uh, a few months after we have excised one. So that is a definite problem to treat. What I do in my practice is excise the larger ones and reassure the patient that um, it really doesn't, uh, the smaller ones really don't need to be removed. They can be watched and removed only if they become uh, bigger and more obvious. Absolutely. So just because there are multiple fibroadenomas, it's not an indication for excision. Yeah. What's the role of high-frequency ultrasound, focused ultrasound in the treatment of fibroadenoma? Uh, yeah, so it's one of the alternatives uh, to surgical excision. There isn't much evidence yet um, on high-intensity focused ultrasound, uh, particularly regarding the late uh, results. Uh, the advantage it has over other alternative procedures like ultrasound guided cryoablation or vacuum assisted percutaneous excision is that there are less um, side effects. For example, vacuum assisted excision can result in a hematoma, which is a pretty significant uh, side effect. Um, so, although high frequency, uh, intense, high intensity focused ultrasound doesn't have these. Uh, uh, kind of side effect, the long-term effect is still not documented. Yeah, so uh, it's good that you brought up vacuum-assisted excision. So there are a few centers, commercial centers in India that are advocating vacuum-assisted excision for very small fibroadenomas. What yeah. should be so the answer? Th 
yeah the only yeah so before we undertake these alternatives we have to be sure that we have a core biopsy and it should be a core biopsy proven fibroadenoma before we go because once you do a vacuum assisted biopsy and um, we if we uh, miss a malignancy then we may end up in in a problem because we wouldn't be doing the right thing at the first instance so we would have to have a core biopsy which proves a fibroadenoma and then probably go ahead with an alternative uh, thank you but the message i wanted to convey is that just because there is a procedure it doesn't mean that yeah. this must be used vacuum yeah, assisted biopsy is not something that is really done or uh, is used for excision although it is done but you know there are other uses of vacuum assisted biopsy and uh, um, you know the, the point is that just because someone has a small fibroadenoma it doesn't mean that you can sell vacuum assisted biopsy to excise it Absolutely. yes uh, miss julie doughty so i think i think that you made the, the the point that if you think someone's got a fibroadenoma so we only biopsy fibroadenomas if they're 25 and over because that's our national guidance we've audited it so if someone is over we only do a biopsy if they're over 25 you're absolutely right if they've got a core biopsy showing it's a fibroadenoma they don't need an operation and they certainly don't need a, a vacuum assisted biopsy that is unnecessary surgery and again the association of breast surgery has got really good guidance now on fibroadenomas where we should be taking out hardly any so again the point you made if they're big and they're causing a cosmetic deformity absolutely but these small often impalpable fibroadenomas, it's really criminal to be submitting these women to a vacuum-assisted excision. Absolutely, point very well made. So moving on to you, um, what's the role of uh, um, treatment of chronic mastalgia due to fibrocystic disease not responding to regular analgesics? This is a question. So again, I think if you look at what I said about how you treat breast pain, so, you know, firstly, I think you try them with simple measures. So again, if they're wearing a bra with wires, you tend to get fibrocystic change at the sides. If it's pushing in, get them to change their bra. I would start with simple things, eliminating caffeine. I would then give them either evening primrose oil or starflower oil, tell them how much to take. Quite often when you then discuss further treatments, so either... Um, danazole or tamoxifen in a low dose, when you discuss that and discuss the side effects, often women don't want to take that. But if they did, and the pain was really significantly interfering with their quality of life, I would start with tamoxifen 10 milligrams daily. Thank you. Role of uh, gamma linolenic acid and tamoxifen in breast pain? So again, I think, I think GLA in some women does work despite the fact the meta-analysis didn't show any benefits some individual studies did so again i think if you're going to use that the first thing is it's not an analog you know some people think you take it you take it for a couple of days it'll work they need to take the dose i put in the slide so they need to see how much gla is in each tablet they need to take 300 milligrams a day and you need to tell them they need to take it for at least three months before it starts to work. So it's not like taking a painkiller. Tamoxifen, I think, does work for breast pain. And again, I would start them on a low dose, but that you have to ensure patients know it isn't licensed for breast pain. Um, so you have to clearly document that you've informed them of that. You have to go through the side effects. But in some women, it is it is very beneficial. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so there's an interesting question on uh, um, breast assessment in transgender patients. And, yeah, I think you can answer that question. Yeah, uh, you know, remember when we speak about uh, triple assessment, the same also apply to males. Uh, even though 1% of the breast cancer is male, uh, the triple assessment in males do apply. So now uh, transgender, based on the chromosomal abnormality, you can have a male breast uh, like picture or you can have a feminine breast or in between. So uh, usually in this, in the triple assessment, uh, ultrasound, 
core biopsy, clinical examination, and uh, memo based on the age and the density is the same. So it doesn't matter transgender breast, female, male, triple assessment remains the same. And a thorough evaluation happens and you will end up in 99.9% .9 the right diagnosis at the end of it. Thank you, Som. Another question is mammography contraindicated in women below 35. Yeah, number one, uh, you know, um, we don't do a mammography as a screening if a woman is less than 40, 45, 50 based on the country guideline. Number one, uh, it's very dense. The information you get may be less. But remember, suppose you have a biopsy proved cancer and if you are planning to do a breast conservation, then in selected patient, then the TH cutoff of 40, 45, 50 doesn't apply. Then mammography do help you to know microcal, diffuse uh, microcal all over if there is any contraindication. It extraordinary patients based on the density, a selected cases MRI can be done. But remember, screening in a pathological, memo is different. We don't use memogram in an young lady. Ultrasound, clinical examination, and that's it. That, that's very clear. What are the absolute, Dr. Kadamri, what are the absolute indications for excision of fibroadenoma? Because we have practicing surgeons and trainees watching this. So what are the absolute indications? Uh, so most women, I can speak uh, from my own experience. Most of the women, once you explain to them that it's a benign condition and it's unlikely to grow further and that it can be watched and the risk of malignancy is almost nil, most of them accept a non-surgical treatment. So it is only, as I mentioned earlier, in an older woman, and uh, or if they are uh, insistent that it's cosmetically affecting them, or if they are anxious about it, uh, then probably, or if it's a larger tumor, um, which is more than about three, three or four centimeters, then probably you could... Uh, advise excision. Not every fibroadenoma needs excision. Needs excision. Multiple Absolutely. fibroadenomas don't need excision. Vacuum assisted biopsy is not the standard of care for dealing with fibroadenomas. There has been few other questions. I don't think we'll have time for so many, but there's been again another question. Why can't we do an FNAC? Uh, despite so many, uh, <laughs> so much of, I think Dr. Somshaker has very crystal clear yeah. mentioned as to why uh, an FNAC cannot be done to reassure a young patient, why do a core biopsy? So I don't think uh, we should discuss about this. Core biopsy is the standard of care and FNA is not the standard of care. So finally- And, and also, Raghu, also Raghu, it's very important to understand in medicine, if you ask an investigation, be what it is. What is that you look at that investigation? What is the information you get and what is the action you would do? FNAC neither will prove it is benign, nor will disprove it is malignant, nor it will allow you to plan whether it needs a surgery or not. Even if you look at malignant cell, you don't know invasive or non-invasive, neither you know whether you need neoadjuvant or adjuvant, and then you have a very high false negative and very low specificity. So you end up with more mess, more misinformation, more delay, more pain, more agony to the patient, and in long run, multiple FNAC is more expensive delaying and adding more treatment. So it doesn't serve any basic of the general guidelines in the medicine. So it's always right to do a core biopsy, which is Thank more you. easy and then get a treatment. Thank you, Som. Role for avoiding Coke, coffee and cigarettes for breast pain, Julie Doughty. So in Scotland, it's avoiding coffee, cigarettes and iron brew. So iron brew is the Scottish equivalent of coke and and coke and iron brew do have a lot of caffeine in it so there is no link between cigarettes and breast pain unless you get periductal mastitis but you know as we should always be educating patients then absolutely as as lung cancers a higher cause of death in women in scotland than breast cancer then absolutely women should avoid those three things with breast pain thank you role of antioxidants in fibrocystic disease uh, no evidence to prove it. And there is uh, one or two questions on um, uh, basically breast cancer, but that's for another day. 
There's one question on breast screening guidelines. So that's again outside the purview of this. We will answer this in the chat box. So, uh, Mr. John Scott, would you take over from me and uh, give your further remarks and end the session and, and your final remarks as well? You're uh, muted. You're muted, John. Uh, John, you're muted. I think you're... I think some network issues may be there. Okay. So I think uh, we've had a very interesting session. Doc, Mr. John Kemely Brennan, would you like to come in? Yes, I can come in. I can come in on behalf of uh, my colleague, Mr. John Scott. So this has been a very interesting session. Um, uh, testament to the um, uh, collaboration that our college has with uh, the Association of Surgeons of India. So I'm very pleased with the uh, high level of uh, talks that we have just heard and also with the um, answers to the questions. So I hope that uh, this uh, series of webinars will continue to improve. And in fact, we have another session in uh, three months time on breast disease. So um, this has been very great. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, John. Yes. I'm back. Yes, thank you. Yes, my apologies. My internet connection dropped out then. But yes, my thanks to uh, all of you for this enthralling discussion about what is a very common problem. Eight to nine patients out of the 10 we see will have benign issues rather than malignant issues. Uh, Dr. Shamashkar for a, a beautiful um, account of how to properly assess the breast and Dr. Kadambari for uh, an elegant discussion of benign pathology, which is again very common, and also the issue of breast pain that was uh, beautifully addressed by Dr. Julie Doughty, giving us a framework to manage these patients who are often very distressed. So my thanks to all of you, and again, thanks from the uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow for this uh, excellent uh, venture with the Association of Surgeons of India. Thanks once again, and uh, good evening. Thank you, John, and uh, a lot of efforts and attention to detail has gone into organizing this uh, session and it is reflected in the record number of registrations. We've had more than 1,850 registrations for this uh, program and uh, I look forward to many more registering uh, for the July session. Good evening, namaskaram and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.